para apresentar. Um, when Luther divulged his 95 theses against what he perceived as gross abuses in the Roman Catholic Church in 1517, he could have impossibly imagined which consequences his act would have. In the course of the 16th century, the religious map of Europe was completely redrawn. Lutheranism was introduced as the state religion in the Kingdom of Sweden, just as in Denmark, Norway, and many German principalities, and incorporating elements from both Catholicism and Protestantism, Angli Anglicanism emerged as the established religion in the Kingdom of England. In the Netherlands, a struggle for independence from Spanish Habsburg rule became closely intertwined with the advance of Calvinism, leading to the proclamation of the Dutch Republic and a privileged position of the doctrinally Calvinist Dutch Reformed Church in this republic at the end of the 16th century. In the Spanish Empire and Portugal, which was annexed by the former in 1580, ecclesial tribunals referred to as the Inquisition forced everyone to profess Roman Catholicism, even in private. Well, obviously, this drastic reconfiguration of the European religious map severely affected international relations. Diplomats residing outside of their native countries came to be in a problematic position if the established or privileged religion in their native country was different from the one in their country of residence. <coughs> As a solution to this problem, it became practice for ambassadors to enjoy what was called droit de chapelle, or droit de culte, <coughs> the right to have within their embassies a chapel in which the established or privileged religion in their native country could be freely professed. After Portugal regained independence from Spain in 1640 and subsequently entered into <coughs> treaties with the Calvinist Dutch Republic on the 12th of June 1641, the Kingdom of Sweden on the 29th of July in 1641 as well, and the Kingdom of England on 29 January 1642, it was officially stipulated that the ambassadors from these countries to Portugal possessed this right of chapel. In addition, citizens from these countries were granted freedom of conscience in their private houses. This implied that Dutch, Swedish and English Protestants in Portugal were exempt from persecution by the Inquisition as long as they kept their religious beliefs to themselves and allowed to assemble at the houses of their ambassadors to profess their faith together. Well, in, the, in this paper, I focus on Dutch Protestants. How did their religious life take shape in early modern Portugal, against the background that I've sketched uh, so far? Well, an answer to this question reveals that the history of Dutch Protestants and their embassy chapel in Lisbon has developed along two lines running parallel to the history of their Swedish and English co-religionists. Well, the first Protestant foreigners to make use of their religious rights in Portugal were the Swedes. In a letter to the Swedish government dated 10 November 1649, the then Swedish ambassador made mention of religious services held at his house, hinting that these services were not only attended by Swedes, but also by Germans. That this was indeed the case is confirmed by an Inquisition report drafted in 1652, in which a woman from Hamburg was said to have listened to the sermons of a Lutheran minister at the house of the Swedish ambassador. It is important to stress here that this woman attracted the Inquisition's attention because there were doubts concerning the sincerity of her conversion to Catholicism, not because she had done worship at the house of an ambassador from a country that was not her native one. Apparently then, as also becomes clear further on, Protestants living in Lisbon, who came from countries other than the Dutch Republic, Sweden or England, could go to chapel at the embassies uh, of these countries without having to fear being prosecuted, as long as the Portuguese authorities did not have a particular interest in prohibiting them from doing so. Well, seemingly in contradiction with this, Lutherans from Hamburg complained in the autumn of 1713 that they were not allowed to attend services led by Swedish Lutheran minister Andreas Silvius, 
who had arrived in Lisbon earlier that year. However, they were not allowed to do so because Silvius preached at the house of the Swedish consul, Joachim de Beige, probably due to the absence of a Swedish ambassador to Portugal at the time. The Portuguese authorities were not willing to permit de Beige to have religious gatherings at his house at all, as the right of chapel was formally granted only to ambassadors, being representatives of the government of one country in another country, and not to consuls, who promoted mercantile interests of one country in another country. The Beige did apparently not give in to the Portuguese authorities, for the Inquisition accused him in 1717 of enabling Swedish and non-Swedes alike to attend religious services at his house. Preaching in both Swedish and German at the Beige's house, and among Lutheran foreigners in the city of Porto, and being suspected of distributing anti-Catholic pamphlets, Minister Silvius was even declared an outlaw, which was announced from all Roman Catholic pulpits in Lisbon on the first Sunday of Lent in 1721. Having to fear for his life, Silvius was compelled to leave Portugal, which he did by means of a ship sailing under the Dutch flag. The first Anglican minister, Zachary Craddock, arrived in Lisbon in 1656. By courtesy of the Portuguese authorities, Craddock and the two chaplains who succeeded him held services at the house of the English consul, Thomas Mannard, and not in the house of the English ambassador. Craddock returned to England after only three years to avoid being indicted by the Inquisition for having converted a Catholic English girl living in Portugal to Protestantism. The third Anglican chaplain, Michael Geddes, whose chaplaincy in Lisbon commenced in 1678, was effectively brought to the Inquisition in 1686, together with Consul Menard. <laughs> Hoping that the Catholic English King James II, who had come to the throne a year earlier, would not be too eager to defend the rights of this Protestant countryman in Portugal, the Inquisition seized the opportunity to challenge the permission English Protestants had had so far to assemble at the house of the English consul. Eventually, <coughs> charges were pressed against neither Geddes nor Menard, but their summons evinced that the Inquisition was not willing to accept the religious rights granted to, to English Protestants in Portugal just like that. Still in 1715, members of the British community in Portugal complained to their ambassador, Henry Worsley, that the Inquisition made efforts to convert their children to Roman Catholicism. By contrast, according to the author of a small booklet on the history of the Anglican chaplaincy in Lisbon, Dutch Protestants in Portugal had nothing to fear from the Inquisition. This, however, is untrue. As early as 1642, it was mentioned in the Synod of, the, of Southern Holland of the Dutch Reformed Church that Inquisition officers troubled Dutch soldiers who, pursuant to the treaty into which the Dutch Republic and Portugal had entered only one year beforehand, fought alongside the Portuguese against Spain. This disturbing report subsequently came to the attention of the States General of the Dutch Republic, which conveyed their outrage to the Portuguese ambassador to the Dutch Republic. And even after Dutch Protestants in Portugal received confirmation of their religious rights in a new permanent peace treaty signed by the Dutch Republic in Portugal in 1661, tensions between them and the Portuguese ecclesial and political authorities continue to exist. In a letter dated 17 March 1693, then Dutch ambassador Johan Wolfsen informed the majors of Amsterdam about the peculiar incident in which none other than the Queen of Portugal, Maria Sofia de Neoburgo, was involved. Wolfson had arrived in Lisbon already in 1675 in the company of Abraham Messu, the first Dutch Reformed minister to lead religious services in the Dutch embassy. The Queen, Wolfson wrote in his letter, had claimed custody of two underage daughters of a Dutch Reformed surgeon who had deceased in Lisbon in order to give these girls a Catholic upbringing. Wolfson considered this to be a blatant violation of the freedom of conscience granted to Dutch citizens in Portugal in the 1661 Luso-Dutch Peace Treaty. Together with the then chaplain to the Dutch Embassy, Johan van Haften, he also approached the Synod of Southern Holland of the Dutch Reformed Church, 
which in turn urged the state general to press for the release of those girls. The Portuguese authorities, however, were not willing to let the girls go, because according to them, the girls, who were lodged in a convent, had voluntarily converted to Roman Catholicism. <coughs> Van Haften and the Synod nonetheless continued to protest, but had to stop doing so when the girls reached the age of 17 and 18, respectively, in 1699. In a resolution issued by the State General in 1722, mention is made of a similar incident. During one of his annual visits to Setubal to pick up salt, a Dutch Mennonite sailor had left his son for educational purposes for a few years with a noble salt merchant living there. Upon this sailor's return to Setubal, it had, it had turned out that his son had been brought to a monastery whose friars had brutally showed him the door. It is unknown whether they succeeded in bringing the son back to his father, but the States General, appealing to the freedom of conscience granted in the 1661 Luso Dutch Peace Treaty, made sure that the Portuguese authorities would receive their indignation over the affair. Children were not the only ones involved in controversies concerning the extent of the religious rights of Dutch Protestants in Portugal. In 1698, Amsterdam-born Nicolaas Koldenhoven was arrested by the Inquisition on suspicion of having vilified Roman Catholicism and having referred to the Pope as the Antichrist. Although he was a Lutheran, not only the States General of Holland and the then Dutch ambassador to Portugal, Jacob Daniel de Famar, threw themselves into the breach for him, but also, interestingly enough, the Calvinists assembled in the Synod of Southern Holland of the Dutch Reformed Church. For the latter, the fact that Koldenhoven was a fellow Dutchman thus outweighed the fact that he was of a different persuasion. Admitting that he had spoken badly of the Pope in response to mockery of his Lutheran faith, Koldenhoven was ultimately released in June 1698 after an imprisonment of four and a half months on condition that he would not talk to anyone about his time in detention. In 1738, another Dutch Protestant in Lisbon, a wealthy merchant named Lucas Noble, was confronted on his deathbed with an infringement of his freedom of conscience by a priest who tried to convert him to Roman Catholicism. In this case, then Dutch ambassador Jan Rogers van Til did not take this violation of the 1661 Luso-Dutch Peace Treaty up with the Portuguese authorities, but instead he made sure that Noble would die as a professing Calvinist in the presence of Henricus van Limburg, the then chaplain to the Dutch embassy. The incidents mentioned so far only concerned individuals, yet it was made perfectly clear to all Dutch Protestants that the Portuguese authorities would not allow them to push the boundaries of their religious freedom of movement. Just as the English in, 16, in the 1680s and the Swedes in the 1710s, the Dutch were not given permission to do worship at the house of their consul, Abraham Heisterman, during the absence of a Dutch ambassador to Portugal in 1717. When there was again no Dutch ambassador in Lisbon in 1732, Dutch Protestants could hold Calvinist services in a room given to their use at the house of the British ambassador. In general, English Anglicans and Dutch Calvinists in Lisbon seem to have been on good terms. Being Protestants, Roman Catholic priests did not allow them to be buried at Lisbon churchyards. The Dutch had therefore successfully insisted on including the right to a burial ground of their own in their 1661 peace treaty with Portugal. The English had been granted the same right already in 1655, but they were only able to rent a piece of land on which to bury their dead in 1717. The Dutch became tenants of a graveyard very close to the English, to the English one four years later. Jointly renting the parcel in between, as of 1729, the English and the Dutch consolidated their burial grounds into one cemetery in 1734. To prevent Portuguese Catholics from seeing the graves of heretics, the Inquisition succeeded in obliging them to camouflage their cemetery 
which is located directly north of the present-day Jardim da Estrela, behind a line of trees. The Dutch authorities, in turn, were shown to be very aware of their Protestant countrymen's well, otherness, so to speak, in Catholic Portugal, and did not hesitate to act accordingly. Risking a diplomatic crisis, the States General instructed the then Dutch ambassador to Portugal, Louis Howens, in 1719, not to comply with the request of the Portuguese King João V to have salutes fired from foreign ships during the Feast of Corpus Christi. Although they, they held the king in high esteem, they accentuated that it was out of the question for Dutch adherents of what was called the true reformed religion to partake in festivities in honor of the Eucharist. Probably in an attempt to be in a stronger position vis-a-vis -vis the Portuguese authorities, they asked Howens to deliberate with his British colleague on this matter. A same sense of Protestant otherness strongly comes to the fore in the sermon with which Johannes Schieving assumed his chaplaincy in the Dutch embassy in Lisbon in 1761. Schieving considered himself to be a missionary and his congregation to be a missionary post amidst unbelief and idolatry. Due to the Inquisition, it was impossible to do missionary work in the firm form of preaching. Yet, Schieving implied that the Protestants assembled at the Dutch embassy should evangelize by leading virtuous and God-fearing lives and as such distinguishing themselves from and compelling the admiration of Portuguese Catholics who could not live their lives in accordance with the true word of God. Although preaching at the house of the Dutch ambassador, Schieving was a Lutheran instead of a Dutch reformed minister. His arrival in Lisbon was the culmination of a significant change in the composition of the congregation assembling at the Dutch assembly that had started in the early 18th, 18th century. Oh, uh, after being prohibited to attend the religious services led by Swedish preacher Silvius in the 1710s, Lutherans from Hamburg and other German cities seem to have found their way to the Dutch embassy. Due to a steady decline in Dutch mercantile activities in Lisbon, they probably quickly outnumbered Dutch Calvinists. As an example, when Lucas Noble died in 1738, Dutch ambassador Van Til reported that there were only three reformed Dutchmen left in Lisbon. It will therefore not have been a coincidence that in 1753, a minister who had exercised his office in the German Landgraviate of Hessen Kassel in the late 1740s made his entrance into the Dutch embassy, Guillaume de Rochemont. It is known that Rochemont, who was a French Huguenot origin, held prayer meetings in Dutch, French, and German in the aftermath of the 1755 Lisbon earthquake and the religious service at the specific request of Lutherans from Hamburg on 18 March 1756. Following his return to the Dutch Republic in 1759, these Lutherans successfully persuaded the Dutch authorities to have him replaced by a Lutheran with a similar good command of German. The choice eventually fell on Schieving, who was not only fluent in German, but also of German origin. In fact, he had mastered the Dutch language only a few years before he went to Lisbon. His successor, Johann Wilhelm Christian Müller, was also German-born. Arriving in Lisbon in 1772 and exclusively preaching in German, he came into conflict with then Dutch ambassador Balthazar Constantijn Smissaert in 1780, due to which he and his congregation were forced to find shelter at the embassy of Denmark. Afterwards, no religious services <coughs> have been held in the Dutch embassy anymore. In turn, the congregation that Muller continued to lead until 1790 ultimately became fully independent in 1818. Still existing today as the Deutsche Evangelische Kirchengemeinde Lissabon, it nonetheless traces its moment of foundation back to Schieving's arrival in Lisbon in 1761. Accordingly, it could be seen as a lasting legacy that the Dutch Embassy Chapel has left behind. Well, in conclusion, this will be very, very brief. Two patterns become apparent in the history of Dutch Protestants and their Embassy Chapel in early modern Portugal. First, 
even though Dutch Protestants enjoyed liberty of conscience in private and were allowed to attend religious services in the house of the Dutch ambassador by virtue of the luso dutch Peace Treaty of 1641 and the luso dutch Peace Treaty of 1661, tensions between them and the ecclesial and secular authorities of Catholic Portugal were in the air all the time, occasionally leading to controversies. As is symbolized by their obligation to hide the Anglo-Dutch cemetery from view, the Portuguese authorities only respected Port Protestant foreigners' religious rights as long as the latter professed their faith in absolute secrecy and lived in total seclusion. With this in mind, it becomes understandable that, on the one hand, German Protestants could attend religious services in the Dutch ambassador, but that, on the other hand, a Roman Catholic priest felt justified to visit Lucas Noble on his deathbed, as this Dutch Reformed merchant had Portuguese Catholic domestics, or that children were put into cloisters when their Dutch Protestant parents were unable to protect them. Contrarywise, the Dutch authorities tended to see the luso dutch Peace Treaty as a safeguard against any Portuguese involvement with their private lives. They therefore, therefore even appealed to this treaty after Nicolas Koldenhoven had publicly insulted the Pope. Secondly, Dutch Reformed Protestants maintained good relations with other Protestant foreigners in Portugal. There was a, in the context of the early modern era, remarkable solidarity and mutual hospitality among Protest Protestant foreigners in Portugal across national and denominational boundaries. German Protestants were welcome in the Swedish and Dutch embassy chapels, while Anglicans from England extended a helping hand to, and maintained a cemetery with, Calvinists from the Dutch Republic. A synod of the latter's church concerned itself with the faith of a Dutch Lutheran. The shared experience of being Protestant and foreign in a country burdened by the yoke of the Inquisition clearly fostered an ecumenical spirit to an extent that would have been unheard of at home. Muito obrigado.